afternoon and welcome. Um, uh, I'm excited to be here uh, and to be a part of IIPP, which of course is uh, founded and directed by Professor Mario Mascara. Uh, for those online who don't know this or, or others, and the Institute brings uh, together an interdisciplinary group of academic staff and collaborators to rethink how public value is created, nurtured, and evaluated. And so this cultural justice series, as Rainier has said, offers us a lens through which we can consider how and to what extent racial, social, economic, and digital injustice has an impact on Black British life. And we will together explore approaches that can help to promote equality uh, and remove barriers to opportunity. Uh, we aim to take into account the value that inform people's opinions by providing a wealthy, healthy discourse, creating a brave space for this debate and the debates that we will have. Um, so today, uh, we are here to visit with Black Wealth Creation and how Black British wealth creation helps the overall British economy. From both an economic and cultural justice standpoint, the creation of Black wealth is vital for all of us. Last autumn, the Inequality Risk Black British Wealth Creation Report was published by four committed young scholars who worked with a team of experts consisting of academics, analysts, bankers, financiers, investors, and other students. The report, which was released, really deals with Black wealth and it's important from both a moral and economic standpoint and the hope is that all people will recognize this. Likewise, the report summarizes the recommendations um, within, with an aim being the, the future of future generations of Black Britons and how they will be able to even prosper further than current generations. Likewise, many are familiar with the economic state of Black America, what is and what would be, which was released in June 2021 in collaboration with the McKinsey Institute for Black Economic Mobility and the McKinsey Global Institute. The report shed light on uh, Black economic uh, participation in the US economy, what it is, where and how it occurs or fails to occur, what disparities cost in both economic and human terms, and what could be realized in scenarios of economic parity. With our lens here in the UK, we understand that the creation of Black British wealth is vital for an economic and moral standpoint for everyone. The volatile impact of COVID-19 on the global economy further highlighted the importance of creating a resilient pathway to economic independence. A key hindrance in developing Black wealth is disparity and access to information capital and education. Wealth is the difference between what family owns for their savings account, checking retirement, housing, and cars, and what they owe on credit cards, mortgages, and other debts. Yet wealth is vastly unequally distributed, we understand, in Black families, both in the UK and in the US. Black households have a fraction of the wealth of white households, leaving them in much more precarious financial situations when a risk strikes with fewer economic opportunities. So as we are here today, we are joined by Gavin Lewis, who is Managing Director at BlackRock. He is responsible for the st strategic direction and growth of the UK local government pension scheme segment. Previous to this, Gavin held several leadership roles at Vanguard access management, including head of UK institutional and wholesale distribution, head of UK retirement, and head of European consult relations. Gavin has also held positions with USB asset management and Russell investments. Gavin holds a uh, bachelor's degree in history and politics uh, from the University of London and holds a CISI certificate of investment management. Welcome. That was a lot. <laughs> <laughs> so let's get started. In Mariana Mazzucato's book, The Value of Everything, Making and Taking in the Global Economy, she argues that public, uh, that policymakers and the public 
have lost insight on the government's ability to create economic value. She believes that our understanding of the origins of value are misguided, and that government should be able to explore, experiment, and take risks on behalf of the public. What are your thoughts on the role of government being able to do this, explore, experiment, and take risks on behalf of the government? Is that where we should start when we begin to think about the impact historically of economic oppression on Black people as a result of the transatlantic slave trade? Like, well, thank you very much for having me. I was, I was actually wondering where you're going to stop on my bio because there's a whole lot more there as well, which you can go into. So, uh, thank you. Uh, thank you for uh, having me. Um, and just a disclaimer so I'm not an academic. Um, and Steve, Steve Dawson sits in the room with academics, talking about very academic subjects. Um, but what I am is someone that works in the asset management industry. Uh, some people are laughing, maybe not all academics, actually not academics, right? Um, let's pretend that you are for the sake of today. Um, so I'm someone that works in the asset management industry, um, and the asset management industry is, uh, should be a vehicle for creating wealth. So I think it fits neatly into this, into this subject. Uh, I'm also someone that grew up in relative poverty. I say relative poverty because poverty is relative. I grew up in in a city in Tottenham on account of staying a civil code family. Um, and I now work in a very predominantly middle class um, environment. So I see the difference. I say poverty is relative because there are worse circumstances to grow up in. I did, so just to say that. Um, and the third thing I am is black, which you may not have noticed. And that has had um, uh, an impact, both positive and negative, on my experience as a black male navigating life. And um, I, I guess I've, I've got to this point of, about exploring this subject. Um, because I do see both sides. I do see um, like the poverty that still exists in places like Tottenham and in city areas. That does um, affect Black people. I would also say that, again, poverty isn't just something that affects that demographic. There are other demographics which are around the UK or anywhere else. Actually, there are poor people who are inflicted by this thing called inequality. But I do think the Black experience is very, very particular. And um, as what you said, it is because of the legacy of the transatlantic slave trade. The, the, the really interesting thing, again, is that I think when we think about the condition of Black people, what we tend to focus on right now is the R word, which is racism, which is still, I think, uh, a taboo subject, even after the events of George Floyd, it became talked about, and suddenly it's gone, it's gone over the last year, so it's gone away. But I also think when we think about um, the Black experience, we do, we do tend to think about that being afflicted by, by racism. But I do think it's important to deconstruct what racism is, because I think typically when we think about it, we think about racism as something which is a behavior or an attitude or an act expressed towards um, a Black um, or brown person or someone from an ethnic minority, which it is. I think we probably overweight that experience because we think that's the cause of a lot of the challenges that that our or that demographic or those demographics face is actually another side to it, that the economic condition. And the two are related, there is a symbiotic relationship. Um, but the challenge that I have is that I do wonder if you change the, the attitude that people have towards you, does it really change our social and economic condition? And my view would be that actually it doesn't. Actually, what we should be doing is focusing on the economic and social condition because that is something that I do believe we can affect. And to Mariana's point, I do think governments absolutely play a role in that, as does the private sector. I think most of our attention should be shifted towards that, because that's probably where we can make change. To bring it to life, I think when we think about the transatlantic slave trade, again, most people indexed towards thinking about it as something which it was driven by views about social hierarchy, um, eugenics, that black people um, were somewhere, somehow, on a human level, somewhere, you know, Darwinian, Darwinian stuff, somewhere further down the table. I think that's kind of been a narrative which has been spelled out, like imperialism was a result of, of racism. 
Um, I'm not sure that's true. I think that you became sort of president, um, president sorry, when, um, when many authors have like, written about this, if you want to geek out on this stuff. Um, this is a book written in the 1960s by a chap called Winthrop D. Jordan, and he said um, that imperialism and slavery was driven by race. Since then, we've seen um, revision of that belief, and there are um, some very, very recent um, authors. Um, this book by David Eltis, and even further back, Eric, um, Eric Williams. And their contention was that actually slavery was a result of um, economics, and racism was used as a vehicle to justify it, which is very, very, very different. And it might not sound different, but it really is. Because if you think about the condition that we are in now as, a, um, as black people as a demographic, it's still in the same hierarchy. I think we need to understand the constructs of, of economics, think about it, so we conceptualize it. Um, just to give you some ideas about the impact of, um, um, of, of the economic impacts of slavery, and some work has been done by UCL's own Nick Draper on this, but some of you get to some of that type of stuff. It's, it's fascinating. Um, but we stand here in the UK. Most of the attention tends to be on the US when we think about this. Look, Britain supplies 80-90% of sugar um, in the 1700s. At the time, revenues of say, two to three million, which might not sound like, like a lot, but that's 250 million um, today. Um, the British government, who, when slavery was abolished, to appease um, slave owners actually compensated them. Um, so some like 3,000 families were compensated um, to the tune of 20 million. Again, that might not, it is a lot, but you know, in GDP terms, it might not sound a lot. Um, today, that's, it, it takes to 16 million. And actually, it was only in the last five or six years that the last payment was actually made. <coughs> so that, you know, we really have to think about actually, you know, where was Britain's role in the world, where was British Empire, what was it founded upon, okay, and, and how does slavery contribute to that? But where, um, as a result, um, are Black people now? So again, we think about inequality, we tend to deal with the symptoms of inequality. So we think about uh, health inequality, we think about crime, we think about unemployment, and some money is um, you know, aimed at reducing the inequality. But those are all symptoms of a cause, and that causes economic disenfranchisement. And actually, to Mariana's point, um, governments can play a critical role in actually getting to the heart of the issue, which is that economic disenfranchisement. And actually, thinking about firstly, how do you reduce poverty, and how do you put those people in a, in a position where they are able to create wealth? So it's a very, very different way of thinking about the challenge. Um, and taking a more economic perspective, I guess my view is that it actually allows us to stop it. It's the heart of the issue of increasing our economic position. Doesn't mean that, you know, when I go to the store, someone follows me and the street guard follows me around, that that isn't a bad thing and we shouldn't try to stop that. But whether the security guard follows me around or not, doesn't determine my lack of life outcomes. Actually, actually my economic and social status does. Thank you. Thank you. So, so, so one of the things you mentioned is the whole idea of wealth. We, of course, live in a very materialistic society where wealth and material possessions quite often are the indicators of success and achievement. In my opinion, wealth and material belongings are inaccurate yardstick, or meter stick, <laughs> to measure one's success. However, the capacity to deal with challenges positive mentality, being able to provide for your family, leads individuals to wanting success. How should we explore wealth? How should we define wealth? So it's, it's, it's a really interesting question. I think you could, there's several ways that, that, that one should think about it. So, the first step we use was to, you know, to define wealth itself, and in your introduction, you, you really began to um, began to do that. So, but so wealth essentially is an accumulation of resources or assets that have an economic value, essentially, and that can be you know, 
a holding in a company, it can be property, it can be inheritance. Um, and it could be absolutely right the difference between how much you own and how much you have. That's the value of um, uh, wealth. Um, but it also is um, a function of income. Uh, what we tend to do so is focus on income um, when actually wealth is probably more desirable because income is very, very changeable. So income can stop, income can fluctuate, income can go up and down, whereas wealth um, is more um, tangible, it's longer lasting, it can be passed down and it can be um, inherited. So we have to think about what, what, what wealth is. The other thing to think about, which is basically what you're, what you're getting to, is that actually what, what are the outcomes of that? Because it isn't, you know, when you don't have money, um, you think that money is the answer, but actually it's the outcomes, as well as the outcomes of that wealth which are, which are key. Um, and there is a, I wouldn't even call it a correlation, there's a straight line between wealth and well being. So, well being being mental um, health, um, physical health, um, role in community, role in society. And there are several ways that we can think about it. So, for example, um, it, it may have moved on a bit now, but still the one that I find most accessible. But there's something called Maslow's hierarchy of needs, which you may or may have heard about. Um, the Maslow's hierarchy of needs basically is a pyramid, and it starts with to live a fulfilled life, you need to have um, basic requirements, and those things like food, water, shelter, um, clothing, the ability to stay warm, etc. And as you move up Maslow's hierarchy of needs, other things um, come into play. So you have to be fairly high at Maslow's hierarchy of needs to be thinking about somebody else or something else other than just survival, which is basically the bottom um, possible. And my view is that um, wealth. Um, allows you to start thinking about other things than just living day to day, and it's those things which affect which affect the outcome. There's nothing intrinsic about money; it's actually what money enables you to do. So, for example, at the top is something called self-actualization, and people that are at that point um, on that side of the needs what they tend to do is start thinking about spirituality, um, well-being of others. Uh, and dare I say things like the environment, um, and because they have they've managed to deal with those day to day, um, day to day aspects. Um, so I think we, we probably, although obviously the discussion is about the economics, probably need to think about the multi dimensional aspects of wealth and what that can afford. Or the other way to think about it, you don't have it, what are you not doing? Thank you. So, so as we deal with wealth, we then can pivot to talking about the wealth gap. Because the accumulation of wealth increases economic viability. We, we get this. Uh, data reveals that significant economic disadvantages have been, been made, and there's a small portion of narrowing around the wealth gap for racial and ethnic groups. Structural racism continues, and it impacts generations, forcing this brutal reality that we're living in around inequality. We realize that for every one pound a bright, of, of white British wealth, an Indian household has 90 to 95 pence. Black Caribbean households hold around 20 pence. And Black African and Bangladeshi households have approximately 10 pence. This gap reflects an impact of historical discrimination and policy failures, such as the Windrush scandal compounded over time towards groups who have contributed significantly to Britain's economy. Help us to understand this gap. And then I'll come back to, to deal with how we can close the gap. So what, when I put the stats around my Black household wealth, I mean, I was, I was like shocked at the fact that we're showing the 10 pounds of but there's, a, there's another one actually which was even more which put it to put it to life even more so question for the for the audience and for people like sorry i can't um, ask you but i will make sure that um 
I relay what the answer um, back is. So, um, in the Asia community, um, uh, the US dollar stays in that community in terms of spending. So, if you, if you in the Asian community, you spend your dollar, it stays in that community for 28 days. So, it moves around the Asian community for 28 days. Um, in the Jewish community, it's like 19 days. And in the white community, it's 17 days. So, pop quiz. How long does a dollar stay in the black community? Probably like this. This guy's like having it. One day? No. Yeah, that's six hours. Six hours. Six. Six. You, that was your first guess. Yeah. Six hours. <laughs> <laughs> I knew you knew it. You knew it. You knew it. <laughs> so, um, a dollar in the US stays in the black community for six hours before it leaves that, that community. And there are. I mean, and I think the study was actually done in like Atlanta, right? Which if you've been to Atlanta is, I mean, if you haven't been to Atlanta, I encourage you to go to the main place to go. But it's black businesses leave black everywhere. And they are um, similar in um, for other communities. Um, so if you go to Orange County in the, um, in the US, my wife is French Vietnamese, and there is a huge Vietnamese community in, um, in LA. And when you drive around um, the Vietnamese community, you know, it, everything is, I mean, the street signs are in Vietnamese as well, but in Vietnamese, I mean, you can basically like buy a house, get it decorated, get lending, tax credit, get equity in the Vietnamese, sorry, in the Vietnamese community. So it's not surprising that there's obviously there. So one of the challenges that, that we have is in terms of that gap, because it isn't just the physical gap of 20 pence and um, 20 pence and, and um, one pound, is it actually the um, construct that we have to actually start building that wealth? That's where the real, that's where the real gap is, that's where it manifests itself. Um, some of you might be aware of um, something called Black Wall Street, which was in Tulsa, Oklahoma, um, and it actually was probably the, you know, the, the embodiment of um, post-slavery um, um, and actually just after the Jim Crow era, it was the embodiment of black businesses. So you had, in Tulsa, Oklahoma, you had banks, um, you had like, lending facilities, you had mortgage brokers, uh, you had people that would fix your shoes or your... So the community was there, but unfortunately, um, the white majority in Oslo Oklahoma didn't take too kindly to it, and to be blunt, they burnt it down. Um, and it's been studied, and I do think it could have been, you know, the, the beginning of the creation of that black wealth. But I, I do think it's examples like this that we need to understand that it isn't what we can't simply do is, which tends to be the answer, and then we're going to come up with the solutions, is throw some policy, uh, throw some money at the issue, because how do you create the ecosystem? It's the ecosystem that allows us to become self fulfilling, and this is where I think we need to think differently about philanthropy and investment because the ecosystem is something that is organic and lives and grows because it's alive. Uh, I think when we, we, we think about it, we definitely need to create, um, we create that um, because otherwise, I fear that we end up doing the same thing where we throw a bit of money at the citizens and not really get into the cause. Thank you for that. So, so, so let's talk a little bit then beyond just throwing a little bit of money uh, to talk about what could be some real tangible solutions. Yesterday, I was with a leader at JP Morgan Chase who reminded me that in October 2020, that they committed to increase spending in Black, Hispanic, and Native American uh, communities and businesses. Uh, I've made a commitment of 750 million as a part of the firm's 30 billion dollar commitment to helping to close the U.S. racial inequality gap. And I understand as of yesterday that they've now matched that with their vendors, so they now have a billion. I know that others such as BlackRock, which, you know, and others have, have increased this. So in a global concept, since George Floyd's murder, there's been all of this commitment from companies uh, to Black businesses for projects and be able to access the funds. How do people access these sorts of funds? How do Black businesses and projects access the funds? 
Yeah, so I think, um, so there's, there's a few things that, that that need to happen to enable us to start plugging the gap. Um, and this is this is like part of it. This is absolutely part of it. Uh, the first is, and I think, you know, I'm not sure what Mariana thinks about this. I'm sure she'll, I'm sure she'll tell me. Um, but I think if you think about being going back to the mountain side, like, the first thing you need to do is just raise people out of poverty. It is, it is as simple as that. It shouldn't be a discussion because you can launch all the products that you want, you can have all the initiatives, but if you think about you know, what people are trying to do day to day, you don't lift them out of poverty. Um, it's very, very challenging to then take advantage of whatever um, opportunities um, opportunities might be there. Uh, and I do think that you know, governments um, have a role to play. Uh, and there are like case studies uh, which have demonstrated the um, outcome. So the concept of um, basic universal basic income or guaranteed income has been discussed, but it's always been dismissed because there's been questions of who pays. It's expensive. Like, who pays for it, and does it actually work? The interesting is that in the US, some um, studies have been done. Um, around actually giving cohorts literally like, like guaranteed income. There was a, um, a mayor in Stockton, California, and um, a few years ago, he gave a cohort, and that's not a big universe, but he gave a cohort of people, about 200 people, um, a basic level of income per month. And then they studied the outcome. And the outcomes, so if you think, um, my, my view around actually dealing with the economics is the cause of the issue, not the symptoms. The challenge is, well, where's your evidence for that? I'm going to be saying and making it up. But actually, in Stockton, California, what they found is that when they gave these individuals um, a basic level of income, suddenly um, they were at home more with their children. They were able to go to the parents' evenings. They called in on neighbors that weird feeling in their leg they went to get checked out at the doctors um, they had time and headspace to apply for jobs which they then got and they then worked in i realize that's only 200 people but actually there are many many studies that have been done like this and the ability to raise people out of poverty and give them a chance is that now that's that that for me has to be the, the first the other challenge i think what we we tend to get into is we what we do is we tend to deal with this in a very piecemeal fashion. So essentially, what we do is we say, right, and I, I think what you know many firms in um, in finance have done. I think I think it's excellent. Is that what we should be doing? There's part of me which says we shouldn't need to you know witness the, the death of someone to trigger all this, but it, you know it happened and, and action is 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 happening. Um, so I think that is a that is definitely a step. The problem is, is that you know an individual to take advantage of this, they have to be in a position to. So how do you get them in a position to take advantage of it? You have to think about the life journey of someone. So you need to think about actually when a black boy or girl born, well, in fact, when the mother is pregnant, right? Is she having like it should be looked after like, from a health perspective? No. There's a statistic around black women, you know, and babies dying. So you need to deal with like the health inequality. Is that you need to do that bit first? Let's get out there. The baby is poor, but actually, what are their what are their life charts? So, right from a community perspective, what are they born into? You know, do they have a community around them? And then that gets into discussions around the, 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 the familial structures. From that from that point, you think about actually what's their what's their experience in education? We know here that. You know, black boys, particularly young black Caribbean boys, um, are less likely to succeed at school. That's typically what people say. What people should say is that actually black Caribbean boys have been failed by the schools because all we do is put the over some of the black Caribbean boys. Just as an anecdote, the 19, you might have seen the Stephen Queen um, uh, documentary um, about boys being put in these unity schools. So I was in school in the 1980s young black Caribbean boy and they tried to put me in one of those special units because they thought I had behavioural problems um, and actually I was just bored because I was really bright. 
But because I'm a young black boy, and black boys are not bright, they said, well, I need to put me to uni. Thanks to my mum, who moved me out of school into a very white school, which led to a whole bunch of different challenges, <laughs> but they didn't have any credit because there's no black kids at the school. They were just like, it's just another kid, and I flourished. So you just think about the education experience um, that, um, that you have. Assuming that individual can navigate and get the best out of education, it's then actually what's their access to the workplace, which then leads to things like when they're at school, do they understand the concepts of internships and sponsorships, um, sorry, internships and work experience when they're in the workplace, are employees recruiting effectively? Then you get into the um, like what's their progression when they're in the workplace. Because the, the challenge is if you only deal with one part of it, what about all the rest? Because one, I think one of the problems that we have in, um, you know, when, when the finance industry tries to resolve these problems is you can like, like build savings programs for uh, minority groups, but they still got to have a certain level of savings, right? To act and take advantage of it. What about everybody else? Yeah. So what happens is you get, you know, in the UK, it manifests itself in the class system. Um, in the US, it can be um, just literally, like, did you have both parents? What schools did they, what schools they go to? So the first thing you need to do, I think, is actually have a joined up approach. And that is what I feel, what I feel when I've looked at this subject and look at my own experience, that's what's been missing. Because we tend to deal with it in, in, in parts. Second thing I'll say um, is that we also need to be able to measure this. Because at the moment, there is no real measure for, and you said it, and we produce this report, like, like inequality, like what is the risk? So how do you compel governments and um, the private sector to do something about it. So the, the McKinsey report that you mentioned, City produced a report that said that 16 trillion has been wiped off the US economy over the last two decades because of not tapping into black um, talent, businesses, discrimination, and the cost of having to keep that um, group where they are. I mean, it's an eye-watering amount of money. So how do you compel them? Well, I think what you need to do is you need to quantify it. And if you quantify it, you have people like, you know, the two of us standing up here and speaking to like-minded people. But for me, it's the quantification of these things that move the dial. So companies and governments respond to, for example, like what we're all experiencing at the moment, inflation. Com governments and companies can respond to inflation because there's a measure for it. Um, it's the same with longevity, like how long do you live for? You're unsure will give you a premium based on your family history, your postcode, where you, et cetera, et cetera because they're able to quantify it. Um, we can understand now the risk of pandemics and we've seen that governments and companies, and companies thinking about how do we cater for the risk of the pandemic? Like it baffles me why we don't have a risk for inequality. Because if you have a risk for it, um, in the way that you have risk, for example, for climate change, yep, so we know that we need to achieve a net two degree zero outcome for you know, bad things, which we're already seeing it happen to the planet. There's obviously a question about whether it's happening enough was happening at all but we can measure it so how do we measure like inequality risk how do we measure um the racial wealth gap in a uniform way that allows companies and individuals to, um, to respond to it thank you so i think we're going to see if we have any questions from the audience and from online because i could go on with my for a while so <laughs> do you have any questions from the audience and we'll start live here uh, we'll go back into the last one. Hi, um, you spoke about basic needs and, and targeting that, and you gave the example of universal basic income. Um, and, and you also spoke about um, large organisations creating several funds to, to um, help black businesses. Is there potentially appetite to create partnerships with government for these organizations to instead help create universal basic income to target that, those basic needs rather than creating those business funds almost. So it's almost a bit of a challenge back to organizations creating those partnerships. And then almost black, black people will be able to access other funds that are available to create businesses um, because they're not thinking about those basic needs or just keen to Explore that as a challenge. So, for the question, for me, that's where it gets really interesting because that 
That's where I think this conversation needs to go. So I think the two spheres have operated in regards to this subject in, in isolation. Um, and yeah, there's, there's a, a number of ways in which it could be done. So um, well, governments and or regulators can impose you know, the, the need on companies to take responsibility for this issue. That could happen. Um, and we have seen that, for example, with like climate change, probably the best analogy that I can think of, where actually governments have said to corporations or are saying to corporations and um, companies that you need to do this, you need to act to produce or be cause on this. So, so it could be done in, in that way. I think what would probably be more um, innovative and might produce maybe better outcomes is absolutely right. So change of basic income, as I said, is that people always think that it's um, like how do you pay for it? It's too expensive. Or it gets bogged down in the in like implementation of it. When I think quite interestingly, it was which might surprise some people. So don't anything you know about shareholder, stakeholder capitalism, but like stakeholder capitalism. Uh, so shareholder capitalism is when actually companies are responsible to um, their shareholders and not to other stakeholders, which could be counterparties or society or communities. Um, and uh, I think the godfather of shareholder capitalism, Milton Friedman, I think most people quote him. Actually, he was a big believer of universal basic income. So you have someone from the business world that is a staunch capitalist that can see the benefits um, of this. Uh, interestingly, we should also know that it has been tried before. So the UK government launched like child ISAs, and these were like almost bonds that you could invest in that would give you know children not to guarantee the income, but it gives them it's like a baby bond, it gives them um but yes, I mean like in, in amongst all of that, I can't believe there isn't some type of solution where you know the investment world where we can create complex algorithms and package up different products and app hop solutions. There must be a way that we can utilize that and also use government. Maybe what, if you had, if you thought about it, if anyone's into like finance economics, but you thought about it in terms of a debt capital structure, um, what you could think about is actually maybe the government takes, you know, the lower, takes the most risk and lower charges. Um, and actually what private companies do is they take a big less risk or even vice versa, if they want to, if they want to return, actually what you do is then you build investment opportunities for those individuals. So people invest in and they get a return, get a return on it. The final thing I'll say is that return needs to think beyond just the like actually what is the like issue in front of us, because if you were to like calculate the economic impacts of spending on the symptoms and not the causes, maybe that is enough. Actually, maybe you'll compel governments and companies to do it anyway because they see it as a risk um, to their businesses or what you can Yeah, we'll go to an online question and then we'll come back uh, live. So, a question here from the audience it, it ties back into how much money is retained um, when dollars are spent or pounds are spent. Uh, so, in your opinions, how far away is the UK? From the US in developing a real support class on businesses to exist, similar to that seen in the US case by Kevin and Tim. And how much does the smaller Black population of this country play a factor in that? To you. So, um, like some of this is being done, right? So, there are some inspirational people who may or may not have seen it. It's called Black Pound Day. Um, some of you may have seen that. I have, to, I have to mention things like this because they get overlooked in the initial part of that like community, but there was some inspiration for people doing some amazing thing actually trying to create that ecosystem of actually spending a pound on black on black businesses. Um, <clears throat> so that's what is being done. So there were also some I think, inspirational groups who launched, for example, Black Business Expos um, that you can go and see right good and great. But like, we have successful black businesses here again you know we have like black companies that are unicorns that have been valued like highly up ipo'd i have a network of amazing um black leaders i can tap into that run businesses and entrepreneurs um 
I think that actually there's two challenges. First and foremost, they're not being utilized enough. So it isn't, so in the US, I think you think it exists, it doesn't exist here. It absolutely exists here. I think that we're not utilizing and tapping into them enough. They get overlooked. And that's where you get into the challenges around, for example, access to funding and access to um, capital. So I think there are, um, there are some statistics. I'm afraid I've got a good head for stats because I've been reading them off, but I can't remember this one. But I think the funding requirements for black businesses or the ability to get funding is a fraction of what it is for, um, for white, um, white businesses. And they tend to fold a lot earlier. And the reason why to get to the, um, get to the question is like, I think, again, we need to think about this more holistically. Like, what is the ecosystem? What is the structure that we have around these businesses? So, for example, your white startup, a startup funded by white, um, what they're able to do is go to, and it's been documented. So, if you want to look at, um, uh, the um, British Business Bank produced a report on this, which is again a fascinating read. But what they said is that the white um, startup businesses are able to go to friends and family first, get funding, probably come from more of a, of a more secure um, economic setting, so are more willing and able to take risk. Um, and then when it comes to funding from people they don't know, there is still this you look like me, you understand me, so I'll leave. I would invest with you. Whereas black businesses, it's hard to find that friends and family because we don't have the same level of wealth that um, our white counterparts do. So think about your ability to go to that one pound household versus the 20p or 10p household if you want a really you know, crude, a crude example. Um, but then also when they're facing off to uh, would be investors, it, it, there is just a rest, the hesitancy to invest with black businesses. And we could have a discussion about why that is. You want, but I think we all know what the you know what the what, what the reasons what the reasons are. <laughs> um, so I would say that we we have some of those structures in place. The kind of some kind of inspirational things we've done here, but what we need to do is we took it over to that next sphere where actually people see the value of investing in those businesses and we start to create um, those ecosystems that allow it to flow organically. Bringing anything to add to that? I would simply say that. Uh, that is part of the reason why the report was done, uh, so that people would be fully aware of what was happening in this country, uh, understanding access to information and what information is available. Because there are uh, many organizations here that are black led that are doing incredible work. Uh, the one that comes to mind at the top of my head is Impact X, a venture capital firm that you know really looks to invest in underrepresented. Uh, minority communities in Europe, but how many people know and what kind of support is going into impact us. So it's about <coughs> having the access to the information on both sides. And if we're doing shout outs, but that's allowed. Cornerstone partners, wealth aids, you know, you've got to check, you know, check some of these groups out. They are doing some incredible things. Um, which like bust the myth that actually like, the black population can't do it. But actually, what's it? What's the, what's the catalyst for accelerating their growth? Is probably the key. All right, we'll go to that corner. Yeah. So a quick comment and question. Yeah. Um, I think in terms of the point you made, in terms of having to get people out of poverty before you can sort of even begin to have some of these deep conversations. Um, and then during COVID, the US kind of increased child payments, child tax credits, um, and that had a dramatic effect on decreasing poverty, especially in you know, African American communities who are more situated at the bottom than the distribution scale. But that fell to the wayside up the ground of people getting filled through and all that sort of stuff. Um, and then in the UK, we had the universal credit uplift, which was taken away last October, um, which was a 20 pound uplift, which is again has a massive impact on low income households. So I guess maybe in terms of getting on the right foot, maybe it's a question of um, not, not having the mechanisms, but rather not having the political will to, to you know, institute those changes. Um, and obviously it's a false economy saying you don't spend a pound today in this pound safe in the future because you know, speaking to people is the way to go. Um, but on the question of reparations and um, the circulation of wealth in black communities, um, in terms of like designing a program, if you do that, um, if wealth aid circulates for six hours, is giving money to you know, black families, black communities, et cetera, um, just putting 
money in other people's hands essentially um, if it slips through our economic net so quickly. Um, so in terms of operations, do you think there's a different way to design that program or should it be sort of instituted under that name or how would you go about sort of tackling that question? Yes, yeah, so the, the, the question of reparations always comes up. Um, on, on the, um, the, the tax credit, I think I totally agree with you. I think, and there was like stimulus, which then stopped, um, and the political will. It, it, I just find it, I think this is a, like inequality is a present risk. And I think that people will always accept. There's a belief in like voters because ultimately this decision decides we like we think that physical will, but actually what's the societal will because you know say you get the government to deserve um countries get the government to deserve actually what is the um societal will to do this and like it to me it feels like it should be an urgent like, issue fortunately it's an urgent issue that has been prevalent for 400 years of the black experience in like the west like it manifests itself now uh, where the other risks may manifest themselves in the future. So I just fear that we if we accept this as the way society is and will always be. That's the fundamental problem. It's almost like how do you shake people out of that? Because if you look at voting habits of um, um, the UK in the last election, actually it was those lower income households that voted for different government, but on what, on what basis? Then we've seen, um, obviously, um, uh, discussions around actually trying to, to level up like, the different regions. But you know that should almost be what those voters hold the government to account to, like, I, because the almost acceptance of that way that society operates like it, it will happen. On on reparations, so I think this is the sort of fundamental difference for me, and I have to declare my my bias. And this is probably where Mariana and I would, would, would differ. And I would, so I I do feel there should be like if you think about that 16 billion. I mean, it's a, it's a, it's a huge amount. I mean, it's a high water amount of money. Um, and I, but I think that you're right. Reparations is almost compensation, and you're absolutely right. It, that, like the, the six hours thing is is, is part of it. Um, I will say, however, that. Uh, I don't believe that because of the examples like stocks in California, basic income example, I don't think that black community would throw away the money at all. And it's really, really condescending. Um, I do think about it. <laughs> I do think it would make it. That's to a lot of people say, like, what they're going to do with it. Who's going to give them the money? So I don't, but I, what, what, because of my, I guess, my experience in the private sector in the asset management world, I think that we could probably do more cleverly, and that is actually how to invest in those community. Because that is just a very, very different concept given money. So how do you how do you invest in those communities? So that doesn't sound like a broken record, but if you're able to measure the young tax potential um, of so you can look at it as risk and reward, so you can think about actually what's the payoff of what payoff of not having to deal with a beast crisis because um, people are ill informed about diet and health or don't have capacity to think about it. So you could think about it from a risk perspective, we could also think about it from an opportunity perspective, right? So actually, if we bring you know more people into the economy, it increases consumer spending and has a knock on effect on the economy. And actually, what's the return of investing in that community? So to, again, to give you some examples. You know, this idea of baby bonds has been like floated around and actually it was rolled out in, in, in Atlanta, um, it was rolled out. So what's the return on like um, investment products aimed at that um, aimed at demographic? But even more succinctly, if you are you know, black, you've had to navigate, you were born in poor circumstances, you have to navigate all the things in life and you get that you graduate from university, you are equipped with a whole bunch of skills that other demographics are simply not. That's the value of you know, that like experience. Like, I know that I think very differently. Um, I think conceptually, this isn't my like this is a passion of mine, but maybe take someone you know who's come from that world to think a bit differently about it. 
So what are we like opportunity? What are we missing out on? Like how you know companies are having to wrestle with and governments having to wrestle with geopolitical risks that we've never seen before, health risks that we've never seen before, inflationary, like stagflationary in environments, um, social upheaval, technological change, you know, shift in demographics. Like it, this is un unprecedented. Actually, it's not unprecedented. History has always been like this. We just have 30 years of relative peace. But we're not used to it. So how do you actually deal with that? Um, deal with that. Well, actually, maybe maybe black people, you know, can contribute to figuring that out because we've had to navigate. Not everyone, again, before someone says, not everyone is, you know, was born in a council state. I know there are people that my experience they won't relate to at all, but there are many who were, and I don't think we're tapping into that. So I also think we can think about the opportunity perspective, think about what the return is. We just don't, no one has measured it. We have these very theoretical conversations, but we need to measure it. And if I could just respond to your point about reparations in, in the United States, just that as an example. I don't necessarily support reparations. Um, in the United States, when we went through legislation for integration, Brown versus the board, and civil rights law and voting rights, there were implementation strategies to create equality because of the inequality that had existed. A lot of people do not, do not realize that the Supreme Court struck down the implementation. So equality has never been realistic and realized in America because there was never a system to institute integration and equality from the government standpoint. So to create reparations and to create laws around it without implementation towards equality, I think is abject failure. What I think that governments can do is provide access. Um, in the United States, what created the middle class was really based upon Roosevelt's New Deal. And it gave access to housing, to government jobs, for people to lift themselves. But because inequality around segregation and there never being an implementation plan to say this is what an integrated America looks like, Black people are not afforded that opportunity. So to create the policy now, I'm not sure if it could work. What I think we need is a new deal, you know, uh, such as what President Obama attempted to do with uh, his stimulus package. But to say, this is how we give education, housing, employment opportunities to these underrepresented, marginalized communities, not to so much go back to repair what has been broken, but rather to actually finally create a viable level playing field to create a middle class uh, in America. Couldn't agree more. Yeah, um, it's interesting talking about this as a financial problem. Um, we've used the word risk a lot, and we've got plenty of ways of handling risk. It's called insurance. And I, I kind of wonder whether we're going down a road where we should be viewing guilty before proven innocent right you know there is a likelihood there is a probability that if you're black you will get a certain kind of treatment and if that happens an insurance policy would pay out on this um so i don't look at this as a financial problem i'm more so look at this as a tech problem possibly because i run a tech company um we have a word called friction where we want, or sometimes we don't want, things to get in the way of the objective of which we're seeking. It seems to me that, you know, putting the black kid in a in a in a referral unit, or police refer, uh, arresting the black the group of black kids, it's too easy. There's no friction. There's very little easy way of monitoring come back. An insurance system can handle this sort of monitoring and risk. And, um, and, you know, actuarialism, if you want to look at it that way. Um, I kind of think this is a friction problem. We've gotten over the investment element. I mean, not gotten over it. We recognise what investment could do. We recognise what income can do. Um, but if you get arrested, for example, that's with you for life. That's institutional. Um, if you're, uh, in fact, you know, if you have, a malefact to many of the public services, this is with people life. So I sometimes wonder whether this is really about 
handling the friction that should be there that isn't in there to capture those issues and have the government pick up the tab for the insurance defaults. It, it seems like an insurance problem to me. I have many ways to go there, but I would say to you in America that insurance companies insured your slave. So it was about an economic power system, but I certainly understand your point that you're making. Yeah, and I don't, I don't, I don't disagree with everything that you that you've said. I mean, I think um, I, the problem is it's multifaceted. But this, this, it, 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 no, it's, it, no one can stand up here and say this is a bit now. Um, because they are all, yeah, it's an insurance problem, it's a, um, it's a lending, it's a credit problem. Right, it's a lending problem, it's, a, it's an equity problem, it's a social It is. Um, I, I, I guess, um, to begin, my disclaimer here is that this doesn't excuse the behaviour that it expressed towards us as black people. This isn't ignoring that. I've had suffered you know, like implicit and explicit racism and it's damaging. The, I guess what I'm saying is like a, a, a multitude of all those problems, which is the that have never been solved before, let's be honest. And the bill, I mean, the bill, I mean, how many times has the bill gone to but like every, it, it, I mean, it, it's still there. You can look it up and actually look at it, but it has never been um, got past um, um, the Senate, got to Congress, has never got it anyway. So, like, if we are going to deal with what is the catalyst to change with the others, Probably the way that I'm trying to uh, try to uh, approach it, because I think what where we end up is uh, this piecemeal approach. Um, so how do we really move the dial? Um, the dial is. We'll take one more in live and then go online. Hi. So I want to talk to you with your black box. So I think no one in this room would disagree that obviously inequality is a mass is a massive problem. Yeah. So everyone is very keen to put investment in. You know, the people that you know, have no wealth. So it's quite clear to help people get to a situation where they can even think about running a business. They need good quality housing. They need to be out of poverty. They need good schooling, and they need good support and mentoring. The whole thing like that. Yeah. So everyone agrees with that when you do it through universal basic income or transfer. The issue is how do you pay for it? And so my question is: the other problem is we've got a world where fifty percent of the world owns two percent of the world, and one of the top one percent owns thirty six percent of the world. And these are people that run things like Black Rock. Yeah. So when they say, oh, our new profits this quarter were nine billion, what what would those companies, what, what do people in your world do when you say, well, what if we were going to go back to the same 1950s and tax them at 70%? Because if we really want to transfer and change inequality, I can't see any way of doing it than taking the wealth where it is to distribute it down. And and you know what's you know what do bankers all say? Is that you know oh we'd all flee the UK and we'd leave and you know we'd all disinvest because the problem with that sort of wealth it just keeps growing every time stocks go up five percent your wealth has gone up five hundred billion. So um so I'm here in personal capacity so I can't. <laughs> <laughs> but you talk to these people we don't have yes, it. So, but, so, but, 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 so I can talk about like the industry mm. um because that's basically the question um it isn't. The same as the one organization, yeah, it's, the industry. it's the industry, <laughs> right? So let's, 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 let's just get that right. So I think the industry, so I, 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 look, essentially, it's it's a it's a, a construct of, of like wealth creation where it where it manifests itself. That's basically where uh, where it is. And it's, there are so like are we? You know, so you could take, for example, like you know, you could take a very um, uh, like nexus of view and say we're going to forcibly redistribute wealth. To do to do that, I think is a, is a political um, question, and it's not the reason why someone asked about why um, the political will is because these things are not politically viable. It's, it's as simple it's as simple as that. So you could do it, you could do it for. Um, I also don't think that what you're ever going to do is stop the two percent from having the having the two percent. Um, I think that that probably is well. Maybe you could stop it, but is that the, is that the is that the real challenge? Well, actually, how do we think about like creating more to use to use more level playing field for the people that don't that don't have because spending one's time and trying to take wealth away from them and give it to them, I feel is not dealing with the, the issues that that community faces. So I guess my focus has been actually how do you invest in that community? 
And what is that community experiencing? And actually, how do you lift them up to um, a level of um, a level of level of wealth? Well, I think that there are ways to <laughs> to to tax the wealthy uh, that two percent so that they can be a bit more cognizant of what is happening with the rest of the world. I don't. I personally don't ascribe to people having that level of wealth. Anyone having that level of wealth, and the level playing field should look like a fair system of government and economics for everyone across the board. What we do find is lots of people with wealth are given to philanthropy. And to me, I think that there should be a shift in the way philanthropy is seen, where we then say the philanthropy is not about us giving you grants and subsidies to do stuff, but we instead give you stock. We instead give you access so that you can then have you know a viable income and resources yourself to create what Gavin's talking about because that's where the hole is. So so how do we invest in you in community so that you can uh, lift yourself out of poverty but have equal access as opposed to saying that here we've been taxed and here's what we're giving in philanthropy. I think there has to be a different model of investment as opposed to philanthropy. Mm -hmm. Come back on that, but I don't want to dominate the whole conversation. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'm looking at the time. We do have more time. I believe your question yeah. might stand on some of these. Yeah, uh, definitely. Thank you. Um, thank you both for the absolute talk today. I'm sorry I was a bit late. Um, I think that um, so one of my questions relate to in terms of you know I'm from Minnesota, so I saw you know a lot of stuff coming out after the murder of George Floyd around a lot of different corporations, companies, and entities trying to make moves and trying to promote racial equality and the creation of different vehicles for that. But I guess what I'm interested in is in terms of to what extent do, you know, on one hand, they might give money to help with George Floyd. And then on the other hand, this was in the case of Apple um, in terms of promotion, promoting racial equity. But then on the other hand, they might be lobbying for things that will uh, affect structural inequality and deepen it. And so it's not really lining up. And so to what extent are there uh, some sort of mechanisms that are looking at what are the political, like what type of lobbying, what type of political actions are these organizations taking? To what extent does that line up with their claims around trying to promote, you know, uh, more racial equity and fairness in society and where that falls short? How, how do we learn about these things to create some sort of accountability around that is one question. And then I think my, my second question is, um, one of the things that really animates my thinking is um, kind of this idea of racial capitalism, which was uh, by Cedric Robinson, and thinking about how capitalism itself is uh, part of how it's able to exercise its power is it uses racialization as a vehicle for extracting more uh, from certain populations of people. And, and I see kind of like that kind of manifest in terms of if I apply for a job, maybe if I'm a white man, I might get paid 20% more, maybe my work would be uh, paid 20% less because of the fact that I am not. And so meaning that it's not just about, I guess, the access, but thinking about to what extent is capitalism itself linked to processes of racialization. And then if that is the case, is really investment in capitalism in these models the way that that's going to try and reduce uh, racial inequality? But to what extent is that possible? Or maybe these things are not linked, but I kind of view them as linked. So, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think it's, I mean, it's a really fair, really, really fair question. Um, because I think if you think about like when capitalism starts to sit and breathe, it was an out of that. You know, industrialization, like slavery. Or so, like in the finance industry, you know, exchanges that we used to trade, they were based on like coffee, like coffee, what they call coffee houses, mm -hmm. where merchants would go and trade, trade sugar or coffee, slaves. Um, and you can still see the culture effect because it was about who you know, what you know, who you have the right standing in society to be invited, which 
you know, you can argue that the finance industry is, you know, becomes a still like still part of that. I think it's very difficult to like extrapolate like race and capitalism. I think it's been it's, it's come out there. Um, the, the challenge of this conversation then gets into actually what is the right, what is the right system, and should you destroy like should you destroy couples? But I think there's a legitimate conversation to have. Um, I and you're right, actually, you can say that initial change the structure and the model itself is it still going to going to exist. Mm -hmm. I think that's a really fair, really fair question to, to ask. I'm not sure anyone has an answer. Um, the pragmatic response is that like we can tend to we tend to think about capitalism as a living, living, breathing thing that has a conscience. Actually, it's not, it's a system of like, like processes and, and policies and, and things which all click into, you know, click into gear. I, I think the question is who do they click into gear for? So mm -hmm. the, the view often is that it clicks into gear for those that have wealth, although, or for example, shelves, which is the which is where a lot of people get like and what like, understand the solution with, with with capitalism. Um so and I there may be a better like economic system or structure. Um, I do think that probably there are examples of fairer capitalism, and that's probably the pragmatic approach is because like a lot of this is bound up from reality, right? Because a lot of times we have these theoretical discussions that like, we should create something new, but uh, and maybe that can happen to same as two percent. Maybe that that can, that can happen, but actually in one's lifetime, like doesn't mean that you should lower aspirations but what can you affect the most many people so i guess where i land is that you know can you create a fairer capitalism because what capitalism is good at is creating wealth which is like who does it create wealth for so you know i like keith would need you know my focus on the black community mm. because of and black what, what's what's the what's the what's the situation of the black community how do we change their fortunes and can we can capitalism actually be a way that they can generate wealth not for the sake of wealth, but to improve their life outcomes, familial outcomes, social outcomes, health outcomes. The question is, what does that capitalism look like? And there is, there have been now, you know, to the, to your point about companies doing one thing and saying another. I mean, you could argue that how like like how like genuine is this? Because I've seen there are there's been a lot of talk about like um, stakeholder capitalism, inclusive capitalism, uh, responsible cap capitalism. Uh, and for many people would argue that actually that's taught, they're not really seeing it. But I I believe and I do I have to because I'm, you know, that otherwise you might as well stop. Actually, companies now realize that they need to have a purpose mm -hmm. and they need to have responsibility either to the environment um, or to societies. I think that is not amongst all, but I think many of now have to embrace that. But I think that that tends to exist because you're not going to change overnight. And if you've been operating one way for so long, the industry, not just finance, but corporates or oil sector, like how do you change that? It, you want a couple of the flick of the flick of a switch. Then you get into where do they put their money? Is it philanthropic? Is it investment? What are they doing with it? And um, it, we have different perspectives because that creates a rich outcome. Um, the perspective that, that I have is that actually capitalism, fair capitalism, could be a way to create create wealth for that community and ease the white community and ease their people at home. I guess my follow up is will that create more racial equality? So, by creating this wealth, is this a way of creating more racial equality? You see it as a vehicle for that as well. Yeah, so again, I think you, you then get back into this question of um, like which. Know, like define racial equality because is it like the attitude that is expressed towards you is it your inability to get a job or actually is it your economic situation it's both the answer, the answer is it's, it's both and um I, they have to go hand in hand because for example and i guess is where you're going is that if for example you had a um you give everyone you know you have a baby bond and you have great outcome education but they can't get a job because there's no one hiring is that I guess what you're saying is that racial representation. No, it's it's not. And if there is in the workplace, is there pay differential? 
is that ratio equity because well they've got the degree they've got the sponsors and they're still paid less is that a, no no it's not so you, i think the two go hand in hand and it won't create it alone but i think what we're basically doing is focusing so much on the other the other bit that we've forgotten about this bit and two i think are simply also going to have to go hand in hand so to dovetail on that what about free market is there a way to consider free market as a part of the solution well i mean i think like the market is um the market is, is a construct of of capitalism um and i i mean there's probably a question here about like like can, can one like what, what communities operate in the market do they take advantage of the of the market uh, it's really interesting um like like when my mom came over in the 1960s she was part of the windrush um windrush generation and that to participate you need resources to participate in the market right because you have really something to have and trade and the, the the west indian community in the uk couldn't get um access to lending so it by either outright discrimination or they didn't feel comfortable like using like, banks etc so um so that is preventative that that stops people from participating and you could argue that if they had that if Tulsa Oklahoma had continued then that they would have participated in the in the free in the in the market um so but they used a different method which was um um credit unions so credit, credit unions were established to lend to black um families uh, black businesses which they set up themselves and the first one set up in Trinity Park in this area actually in in North London what that actually creates is a different market and like what's the value of that market probably less i would say than the others but it's still a market so or i guess there's my view but actually like define define what the market is because i think what you see with these startups is that they create their own ecosystem um and um there are plenty of examples of uh, you know getting funding because i know we talk about they can't access but actually many have and they've done really really well so the market the different types of markets those are all free and it's not just the you know trading on the FTSE um or the um uh the SP. I didn't think you were going to go to credit unions I thought you were going to partner okay <laughs> <laughs> and I had to give a shout out to the credit unions would you like to add anything else to the responses um then at this point we'll pivot to an online question and this is kind of speaking to that access point of you know, we talked earlier about the opportunities when someone had asked about supporting black businesses and that there are so many opportunities that do exist here. Um, this person's wondering about how to connect people who want to give early um, entrepreneurs, social entrepreneurs access to the types of organizations that were mentioned uh, and kind of that information gap. What have you seen been done well in terms of connecting those pieces? Uh, just how do you do that well? Get people those opportunities. Yeah, I mean, it, 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 so like someone like Impact X, that's what they do. Mm -hmm. So they find these companies and they like go to investors and they so like, I, I think probably what, what maybe what the question is driving at is you have to kind of be in a know to know that. Mm -hmm. uh, so it clearly hasn't. Question is asking there's obviously an opportunity there to do that um, and maybe we're not doing that enough but i actually think that if you look if you have it's not going to come across your desk but if you look for it i think you know be intent, intense about it i think you can find it um for example there are as i mentioned there are like black business shows that are held in like excel i mean these are and they showcase anything from like financial saving to entrepreneurs to tech firms to start up and they do exist uh, i just think you have to be intent about looking for them there you can access them uh, and they are on social media they are there and they are calling out for probably that type of person who's posed the, who's posed the question so there is no clearinghouse that we provided that i'm aware of no there's no central it's not central but i mean there's a new uh, new venture fund that's just recently started. 
So, I mean, they are, they are all over the place. It's just a matter of having access. And I guess we have access because we're in that network. So, if that's a thought, so to, the, to that question, maybe part of this work can be creating a clearinghouse so that people can actually know what funds are available. So, yeah, that's a takeaway. Actually, how do we raise the profile? Can I just add, there is a lot of black business shows that advertise via Eventbrite and of investors and businesses, and they showcase their businesses and also investing opportunities, and that normally happens on a yearly basis. So that's another way to see what's available and that what's out there. Yeah. We'll come back here. Any other live questions? I've got one question. Um, you talked about uh, hesitancy in investing in black businesses. How can black businesses overcome that obstacle, or what can they do proactively to try and improve that issue that is still around? Yeah, I mean, it, 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 the party says is the responsibility of those black businesses. We're not getting the money, right? So, <laughs> so like, we have to like figure out, and like, we have to take responsibility for um, for it. Uh, and but then I think there's the other side of the equation is what we need to deal with that bit as well. So so I think for the for the black um the black business, and I'm not a um you know I work for corporate, so uh, they will say they are doing everything they can, and I know many of them and I do think they are. Um I think what we can also do in addition to what's already being done is think about actually like how do we create that like, sponsorship. How do we create um, like avenues whereby they get access to? If it's not investment, like there's a whole world of expertise. So how do we, you know, like, let's get like marketing expertise, legal expertise, but we set up in the right way the operational side of things? Because um, often, from what and I would defer to some of like the impact text the course of the world, it isn't about like credibility. It's probably more about actually how to like what. Like what's the audience and are we actually appealing to them? Because the language I think is very, very, is very, very different. On the on the other side, again, I don't feel that you know, enough is being done to invest in those businesses. Because investment doesn't necessarily need, need to be straight away that needs to be money. There's a whole huge amount of IP that exists, which you can give away for free unless you count an hour or two. Um, so like if you have you work at a corporate and they have the marketeers, like legal people, like actually what would be really helpful to those startups is just actually here's how you know, we would do it, here's how we structure, or let me introduce you to 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 so and so. Um, the other entity, of course, is to, is to like do it via commitment to organizations, which has been done. And I think you've alluded to some of them, and that is um, that is also happening. And that's happening, I think, in two ways. Firstly, the corporations are saying we will just simply invest in black businesses. That's great. But then there's also the if you think about supply chain or the value chain in the ecosystem. So, like a lot of organizations might so they actually be, aren't able to invest directly in the business, but maybe the question is, well, who does your like who's your accountant? Who's your accountant? Who's your legal firm? Who's your marketeer? You know, yeah. And actually, there's degrees of separation where the best investment we can give is just by giving someone a contract to say we use your services. I think you could also think a lot more naturally about it, um, about it as, as well. But some of it, I'm sure we're thinking of the same trade shows, the Black Business, business Show, mm -hmm. Black Investor 360, HSBC, HSBC do yeah. one, Barclays do one. There are like, many like, like firms out there that are doing exact, basically doing exactly what we described. Mm -hmm. Uh, and maybe for those businesses that aren't aware, it's just how do they get onto those, how do they get onto those things? Because maybe more can be done, but I think we do feel that people start to awaken us with the way for to the um, opportunity. And I'll add to that, I think that there are two elements <clears throat> that we have to deal with, both economic and moral poverty. How does one see themselves and how does the outside community see that community? So that's around the moral ethnic di the dynamics of poverty. And you know, in, in, in historically in the United States, a uh, black Wall Street or these, uh, you know, the black belts in Chicago, or where there were these thriving black communities where community invested in itself and didn't need outside investment, 
but others would then want to invest in those communities. So we have to revisit that. How do we lose that arguably assimilation wanting what the others had and thinking that their community was better than our community? So how do we revisit our value of ourselves and our communities and then stimulate economic advancement and growth in those communities? How do we have the same kind of gentrification in our community without removing it to our community? How do we add that kind of value? Uh, one of the things that I noticed most when, when I moved here to the UK was that I was trying to find this enclave. My family lives, my mother lives in the wealthiest Black county in the United States of America. Where was that community in the United Kingdom? Where would I move? And I just started searching, like, where is this community where people see a reflection of being at least middle class? How do they see that where they go to their bank, to their supermarket, to everything? And my mother would leave her community. How do you create those opportunities that then it becomes a part of the erasure of the stigma around what Black people do and don't represent for themselves? Mm -hmm. And where you can see that added value. In my mother's community, which is an anomaly in America, the, the dollar stays in their community 60 days. Mm -hmm. But they have everything in their community that they need. There's no reason to leave it. The value there, the largest churches, the supermarkets, everything is controlled within that county, Prince George's County. Uh, so it is controlled there. So how do you create those kinds of systems? That's an eth ethical, moral, and economic kind of stimulus that you have to have mutually. The thing to think about that is what we what we tend to do is look black. We look outside. Um, so the questions immediately get to what do, do other people need to do for the black community, which is definitely part of the discussion. But like we have intrinsic value that is not being realized. That's this is this is the difference. So this, that, that, how do you unleash that? Think about I can talk about finance, which is a kind of representation, but think about like what's the what's the economic value of our impacts in music? economic impacts of musical sports. We look down on these things because we're like, we're, well, that doesn't that's only sport music. Well, no, it's not. These are multi-billion industries that we you know have real influence and we own um sports teams like record like record labels that has huge cultural impact into the value of what's the value of that. So how do you so one um, again, I'm not stealing his idea. This came from um, a one George the poet, who I did a podcast with, a podcast with. Um, so, like credit to credit to, to him. Um, but like, could you extrapolate that and apply in our areas? Because that then there's an intrinsic, intrinsic, intrinsic wealth. So the other thing, what we don't have in the we haven't had in the UK is that like black professional class. For many many years, we do now. That this does exist. The problem is it's very very dispersed. But there's a myth that it doesn't exist. Actually, it does. Um, and there are, you know, some called the power list. I think anyone's ever seen it. It is a um, annual list of the most influential black Britons, and there are supplements that just focus on finance, but it goes across the area. And every, there are different people here every year, and there's a list of like hundreds. So. There's two, three, four hundred thousand. So, like, what? How do we? How do we tap into that? Which is a very, again, it's a very different conversation to, you know, that the community needs this and needs that. It's actually talking about unleashing that potential. That's the that's the difference. And then it gets to what's the white system in which to do that? Which of course is just like. I'm so sorry, <laughs> and I myself to ask the question. <laughs> First of all, thank you for. for Amazingly interesting. And um, I suppose I'm really sorry, kind of have to go back to the question I next one asked because it's been really, really interesting to listen to what you've been saying. And I really enjoyed your analysis that you gave in the beginning about um, the racism as an outcome of economic, economic factors and economic interests. And I think it's also similar, for example, to what to Mark Pitty wrote about um, global inequality and kind of like, how you have to pay um, reparations to France and to the 2000s, I think, which is a teacher that's thinking about it. So, like, all of these ideas of how do you bring Black people into business and how to get funding into, into black businesses. And then also what you said that might be helpful to quantify um actually the economic value that can be created in black communities and by black people. I mean the question is who is this value created for though, right? Because 
And how can you leave the two percent or the one percent out of the conversation? Because all of that takes place in this ecosystem or in, under these conditions where um, basically a, a small group of people um, controls much of what's going on politically, which is also like suppose what kind of plays into when you said that you love just tackling people might be might be um, um, not very realistic. So you have that. And then also like the people who actually like make the big money, um, many of the businesses um, rely at least partially also on wealth extraction. And they actually very much profit from people not making it into certain economic um, um, circumstances in the first place. So I suppose my question is just how can you only talk about people lifting up without also talking about this context of other people having the best of economic interest and people not being lifted up? So, um, I guess if I can raise the concept of capitalism, yeah. there is a, there's, a, there's a form of capitalism which is a, um, an FT editor it, called Martin Wolf, and it talks about right here, capitalism, which is so that my family in Jamaica, so Jamaica, of course, it was um, a stop off um, to the transatlantic mm -hmm. slave trade. Um, uh, and was very resource rich in terms of coffee and sugar. Uh, and then after slavery so ended, obviously, it became a, you know, still is a part of the British, British Empire. Um, and it, what, like, when say capitalism, like, it's is essentially companies that go into a region or state, or in the, they can in the UK and extract, extract value without creating, without creating value. And I guess the value goes to a certain number of number of individuals. Again, I, I probably need to get someone else who's better well versed in how to like redress the, the balance between the two percent and the and the rest. I, like again I'll say it's not my own expertise, I wouldn't feel um, comfortable commenting um, about it. What I what I would say is um that like like the, the capital which exists which, ex, which like extracts value that's something which I think we probably need to have need to think about and actually what's like what is the back to the question that the, the lady asked like what is the what is the form of capitalism which exists because again I don't like the two percent of individuals you know I don't without changing this big bit in the middle like how much of it is going to reach the people like down here so actually what is the what is the construct in which we in which we operate uh, at the moment, I don't think anyone's really, I mean, I mean maybe you know, we were from the academics, maybe someone can throw a name at me, but like the, the viable alternative, like what is, what is that? What does that look like? That probably needs to be discussed and um, think about like, what, like racial equity capitalism, which is probably phase of the discussion. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's, a, it's a totally a legitimate question. Because unless you talk, oh, go on, you have something. Solution: The only solution is with one word: tax. Tax. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, if you look back in the post-war period. The, you know the period where you, your your parents, my parents, were moving to take into the country. People were coming because this country was growing, and then there was more housing being built, being created. Universal education, you know, secondary education came in, higher education came in in the fifties and sixties in the country. We saw the biggest reversal in, in in inequality that we had ever seen before. Yeah, and we had top rates of fifties. It was ninety five percent was the top tax rate at that point. You know. If you were owning Downton Abbey and you sold it, you paid 95% of it in tax. And that's how we created wealth for the bottom. And, and that was in a time where racism was the norm. That was the, the default way of saying. So that was, I can see that you, know, you would have really struggled then, you know, in many ways. That's why, you know, and I would love to see now, surely we would have a much more, you know, I don't know, we we There'd be other issues, but if we we can't even start tackling if we don't have the money coming from. But well, I would believe, and I'll come to you that the taxation would even work to create black wealth. Mm -hmm. No, it definitely it doesn't. I think it, it doesn't. See that. And, yeah. and so then we, in some ways, still try to look to capitalism as a possible way forward mm -hmm. if we can gain access, because government systems haven't. Impose itself in such a way that taxation would make the difference in black communities. Mm -hmm. 
So we're kind of stuck in a balance. So to Gavin's point, what is it that helps to create that wealth that's intentional towards Black community? Because policy has not been instituted in government in such a way to ensure that Blacks have access. If so, we would see it now. So why are we going to do further taxation to create more opportunity for who? Because yeah. yeah, in the, in the, in the, in, because understand the level of taxation that happened in the 50s and 60s, mm. that the Caribbean community that entered the country mm. entered into service level jobs, nursing, mm. Mm. bus drivers, um, administration, clerical, and they've never moved. And our community hasn't been able to move out of that sphere. Mm. Um, so again, you get back to the point of like when we like do this, these things with the big part of the system. I don't think there's been a like, and it's certainly not in the UK an example of black people benefiting from it. And my concern will be that, that's yeah, that's that's the challenge. That is that is the challenge. And I understand there's an implementation challenge here as well. Um, but there's also this sort of like, what is again the the, the, the discussion is actually not that might be the answer or part of the answer. But what we don't have is the other side of the answer, which is what do what can we do? Like what does our community have? Like what like what's our potential? Sounds like PhD work. <laughs> <laughs> like, like, so what so because if it, again we always index to you know this needs to be done for us, to us. Mm. Like actually maybe we and it doesn't seem that the system is perfect. It's not, of course it's not, otherwise we wouldn't have policy. But actually, like like what you know, what do we What's our value? What can we do? And how do we take advantage of what's there in the front of us? Supposed to waiting for something extraneous to happen, which we've yet to see. Yeah. 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 I'm going to take the opportunity to ask a question. <laughs> um, <laughs> so I'm hearing you know, the access. There are so many different levels that we need to address. Um, you know, what can we do? How do we see the value? That sounds community based. There's the level of the investment firms giving investment. There's the level of policy, creating the policy or backing, getting support for UBI, for instance. And to me, this speaks about the question of what's the narrative, what's the story to get whoever is in that position to um, make that decision, to get that policy through, to say we're going to invest in these businesses, to um, get people shopping in their own communities, whatever that intervention looks like or that action looks like. It seems to be a, a story um, and the power of communication. And I'm just wondering if, if either of you were, let's say, running strategy on communication <laughs> with the ultimate goal of, of having black wealth creation, where would you start? Who would you start with? What, what do you see well? What's happening well on the, the communication and storyline side? What do you think is not working well in terms of the stories that are out there currently? That you'd like to change and not see. I'm just I'm just thinking of that story, the narrative, that communication level, and where that intervention point is, and how to do that effectively. Yield to my guest first, always. Okay. Uh, so fortunately, this has been done just with a very different challenge, okay. like climate change. Okay. So, like climate change used to be. I'm pretty sure 20, 30 years ago, that probably maybe this building, a room for people. Having this discussion about climate change and what to do with it. And now it's us talking about you know, racial inequity and what to do with it. That's the reason we're it. It was seen as very niche, like we were not only certain people cared about it, it was seen as something that urgent and things uh, because of the challenge. Um, and if you look at what's happening with climate change, it is on the agenda. Not only is it on the agenda, and this is the, the difference I think is that people take personal responsibility for it, whether you believe. In climate change or not, because where it was 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 in the realm of beliefs and values. I believe that the you know, temperatures are rising. I don't believe that temperatures are rising, and it probably still is. A, it may be there is, maybe there isn't. But they probably find people of both sides of the spectrum that some believe this. But a number of things happens to move it from this like conversation with some very passionate people to something which we all think about whether you want whether you want to consciously or not. And those things are um, and I sound like a bit of a broken record here, but Firstly, there was a measure. Like we are, we actually were able to measure 
what the outcomes of if we didn't resolve this, what would happen for good and or and or bad. Um, governments um, had to respond to societal pressure because there was a button, there was a swell of um, uh, public, but predominantly from like white middle classes, and that, that's and that's actually nothing. Well, that's absolutely fine, but they felt this was a challenge that would threaten their or their children, their children's children existence. So there's societal societal pressure. Um, you saw the impact of it. So, you know, it affected people's lives, you know, wildfires, droughts, floods, you know, you could, you know, um, tsunamis, all these things are, you know, out outcomes of um, uh, climate change. Um, you had profile, you know, you had people that spoke up, you know, Al Gore, um, Greta Thunberg, you know, people who actually stood up and, and took it as a personal, and all of that has led to like governments like you know committing to you know Paris um, agreements. But actually, what it has done is, you know, how many people here will be driving an electric car? How many people here? I mean, who use a plastic bag? I mean, what who uses the one's last one's a plastic bag? Um, you recycle, you think about it, like we put it in the green one or the other. We all do it because climate has been seen as a risk. So the, the question is. Um, I and mean, of course, you asked us the question, and because we're standing here. But I will say, with this like challenge of inequality, like it's very easy to think that this is a very institutional problem. But actually, individuals can take responsibility. So I'll say to them, when it comes to this issue of racial inequality, like what's your plastic bag? Like what are you doing? Because if you want to, you can. Yeah, if everyone moves the dial, everyone, if everyone did something, it would begin to move the dial. And that could be across. Okay, so maybe someone mentors, maybe someone sponsors a black business, maybe someone gives to um, charity, maybe someone like you know puts uh, academic thought behind it. If some, if everybody was doing something, then it would change. Until I guess my view is that until you get that individual agency, it will forever be these types of discussions. We sort of very theoretically, it will forever be. The institutions, governments, companies problem. It's our problem. Right? So it's great that you've come here or listening, but actually, what are you doing? And I would say one of the models that I know that has worked for these challenges. Um, I started in economics, uh, then went on to get a master's and started working on a project called the spirituality of economics. At the World Bank, which led me down the path to, to study theology. Um, and I landed, I, I left investment banking because I felt that my people would remain in poverty if I continued to do what I was doing. So that was the reason why I left, but I'm grateful that you're still there. <laughs> 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 so all, all of it works together, right? Um, and so I departed from that. Because and, and on this journey, I found this, you know, this theological understanding uh, that in Christianity that Jesus said, "Before you will be with you always." And because of my work in economics and research around commerce and, and all this, I began to unpack whether or not Christianity had played a vital role in poverty, and whether or not it was a way forward to eradicate poverty. So I began to do a study. Uh, on black churches, black mega churches, to determine whether or not what their incomes were, and discovered, you know, this this is like 10, 12 years ago now, that of these 300 defined mega churches, that they have over three billion in revenue, but that revenue was not going back to the community. So there are models. And some of those leaders of those churches were not black, but they had black congregations. So there are models there of how to message in community, how to create wealth, and how to navigate around it. That could be from the perspective of faith, of how you believe in what you believe in, how you institute that. The challenge with that was the lack of reinvesting in the people who were giving into the scheme. So, so there are models that absolutely exist in community 
uh, but by no means at the same level of how we see the top percent with all of the wealth. But that would be my messaging to, to look for in communication, to look within to what you have value systems within and then how do you how do you tap in how do you, how if they would have and i'm so far away from this report in the study now if they would have taken and tied back into community the kind of wealth or level playing field that the church itself could have instituted into those communities and lots of them have housing development corporations and all these sorts of things as well but it was not the same level of investment that i argued that 10 percent would have created in the communities where those churches still exist just look at the wealth so just one final point the wealth we've had this moment with george floyd that was the awakening right it just what is have we has that momentum been that social conscience has been lost that's probably one of my question and just one other thing that we haven't come into is like financial education just this whole concept of saving investment this is all great having this conversation because that's teach kids yeah like what how do you budget like that thing it's kind of pointless isn't it so it has to go back into um people's face experience can i put on that yeah so i've written this question down and i've been thinking about that it's a great jumping off point in short, my question is how do we catch up on some workshop facilitator one of them that educate these financial independence, especially young black people, but there's many elements in the black community that don't know. And again, the, the kind of how much the black pound bounce in the community isn't new to me, but when you see the current situation of the world right now, you've got the new digital industrial revolution or the sixth wave of industrial revolution where we now have the modern day Robert Barron's, um, like Henry Ford's, and um, Rockefeller's in the name of Elon Musk, um, Zuckerberg, um, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So it's hard for, because I'm working class, we're not generation, but seeing my parents go from coming here very little and then growing and me trying to continue that legacy, there's always that feeling of being left behind. So I think when you are talking about the sudden discussion of the marijuana industry, and literally I was, I was reading a report on a few about Sidney Khan talking about that in California, and this government saying no. But it's interesting how, when you think about how many black people have been arrested for selling weed to pay and to support their families, but now you have all of these white companies doing the same thing. There's one company called Dutchy Pot, which as a Caribbean person, you know that that's a Caribbean term. And our white person is using that term to sell wheat when black people have been arrested. So my question is kind of summarizing all this, as well as the fact that you've got all these big companies, Amazon, um, Apple, Netflix there, instead of saying, let's support you, it's like, let's bring you into what we have already. There's so much kind of almost um, innovative gentrification, mm -hmm. like Apple's brilliant at it. Facebook does it all the time. They have WhatsApp, they have Instagram. They're now, they're now going to kind of colonize the metasphere. So how do we catch up? How do we go from the, the six pence to the one pound when we're constantly behind on the back foot? And unfortunately, I know we're in an education perspective, but education isn't sufficient. It's not good enough. And I shouldn't have the job that I have now. Education should be what I should be doing. I wish I could answer that. I know, right? But there's a few things I can that you highlight that the, the point around like the fact we've missed out. So for example, we missed out on like because of redlining and then Jim Crow laws, the huge housing boom in the US. Like the black community missed out on the big housing boom in the 80s. Um we missed out on the financial boom because we weren't in finance in the 80s. And we were to the right about to miss out on the tech boom as well. So um and I honestly I, I, this is why I'm here to try and figure it out. And I don't know. So we, I guess we either, there's either, I mean, there's three ways to, to think about getting to the answer, because it's, I don't think, it's certainly beyond me to know what the, what the solution is. Either there is something like catalytic, catalytic which is done, which is there is just stimulus, which is given to the like, black community to help them catch up. And that conversation then, Usually it gets down to well, what is that reparations or investment? But I think it was this idea of like 
capital to capital. Um, there's always a question about uh, like education and like doing it in the traditional route, but then as the lady said, like, are, are you just existing within, are you existing within structure which is against you if you go down the traditional route, like you know, company, etc. And one first is that like can you get enough people into, into that? Um, and the third way I think you said Keith, is like is, is access. Like actually, how do you create those pathways for that community to take advantage of those things which are which are there? And I, I certainly realize that that means that you are almost accepting the system which exists. Um, and the, I guess the, the next phase of this is, is that the right thing to do? Do you need to reform the system itself? Does the system, the system allow it? When we say the system, I think you mean, you know, a corporations, education, the judicial system, all the things that you refer to. Uh, so that I think probably needs to be the next probably where like the institute needs to probably take the discussion, which is if these are the mechanisms by which to change the app, actually what would what would actually work? Uh, and that's just three that I thought of was probably a whole bunch of others. I'm and, sure you thought about it. And I think that there is a lot that is happening. I mean, go back to Mariana's uh, the value of everything. And the role of government, right? What is role of, of the role of government and its ability to create economic value? So when you talk about the cannabis industry, the government has a role. It has a role in ensuring that there's fair play in what's happening. If it is now in this country for Crohn's disease and other medical uh, conditions that it's now legalized for, we know it's coming. How do we ensure access, information, policy being delivered into Black communities so that they have an opportunity at the beginning of this industry really booming because it will be for recreational purposes in this country in the next five years, I can guarantee you that. How do you ensure that Black people are in fact able to invest is that by saying all of these who have had crimes, you know, that have criminal records based upon it, are they the first partakers of access to this? As a part of this whole argument around reparation, you're repairing something, you criminalize something, and here's an opportunity. So government does have a role to actually truly explore uh, an experiment and take risks on behalf of the public. Like, I think that would be an excellent way of looking at it. And we have to really push forward those kinds of narratives and, and not be in the back of the room, but making sure that policymakers, government is well informed of what our thinking is and how this could create self sustainability. I'd like to, I'm just so smart. So, you know, like, please question about the free market, the markets. Right. I'm 44, so, you know, I'm now these kids, I'm old. But you speak to a 25-year-old, right? That even a 25-year-old into the corporate world, their lot and their ambitions are not to become CEO or manager or director or whatever. They want to run their businesses. And it's there's been a I, there's been a whole like, like slew of like big like younger um, black people who are basically saying that you know what, we will create it ourselves. So you see them really. Just look at the music scene. The, the black British music scene is what is now a multi billion dollar in, multi million pound industry, is what you get right. And that's purely self created via the democratization of music and social media. And then you see the same thing in the business and finance world, where a lot of individuals say, actually, you know what? This will create our own ecosystem. Not the black business shows that um, the link you referred to earlier. Let's start by black people. Like black pressures, so like this, it, 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 there is a another way, and this is what you know. Again, I'm still from this what George the poet is showing me about, which is this value of what we do already. Actually, actually having create ownership, um, ownership around it. So there's nothing. There's absolutely nothing. So I think we probably need to prepare. Yes. So we're at five minutes until, um, and there's been I know there's more questions in the audience. I know there's a lot of questions online as well. Um, I think that 
speaks to uh, maybe interest in the rest of the sessions we'll have in the series, even though it won't be specifically about black wealth creation. Um, do, do look at the, the next sessions to come in this series, um, as well as maybe we can look at continuing this conversation beyond today's session as there seems to be a real uh, desire to continue it. Um, but we'll wrap up today with a couple questions or one basic question here, um, kind of on your outlook. How do you feel about the future of Black British community and wealth building? Um, and then if you could share any last you know, closing thoughts. Well, I'm going to start so that he can finish. OK. <laughs> <laughs> I'm an eternal optimist. Uh, I, that, that, that's how I live and breathe. And I think there's enormous opportunity. Uh, that was the reason why I signed on to support the report. If you would like to access the report, you can go to blackbritainbeyond.org.uk and you can find the report there on the home page. Uh, but there's a lot of opportunity. And I'm committed to this work and to ensuring that we continue this conversation on a number of levels. One, providing people access to the report, ensuring that people have access to information, capital, right, and education, uh, which is, you know, the space that we're in, I think is vitally important. And that we continue the conversation, we continue to illuminate this as important and essential, and that we hold both accountable government and the private sector to ensure that they're investing in our communities. And yeah, I well, I think I have to be optimistic about it uh, because otherwise I have to keep going. But, but also I think when you do look at the next generation and what they are they are doing, it, it hasn't been done in the way that they are doing it. And it is truly inspiring and pretty amazing. I think just need to help scale it back, scale it because it, it, it is happening. It's just that it's, we need to, how do we grow it? So I, to your question, maybe we've already figured it out and we just actually need to get on the, the journey with them. Um, and I, for that, I feel, yeah, I feel positive.